More than 4 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories on this edition, making a difference in refugees' lives. A look at the efforts of some groups trying to make life better for Palestinian and Syrian refugees in Lebanon's Shatila camp. And stories of the voiceless, the struggles of Rohingya Muslims who fled to Bangladesh to escape persecution. We are sitting on a like time bomb kind of thing. It's ticking all the time. And if we don't keep on reacting, it could just explode any moment. I'm Natalie Carney, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. Throughout history, conflicts in different parts of the world have driven out groups of people from their homes into places that offered refuge. One of those places is here in Lebanon. This is Shatila Camp. It was built in 1949 for Palestinian refugees. Today, this camp is home to tens of thousands of people, and not just Palestinians, but also Syrians who have recently arrived from their war-torn country. But in and amongst this grinding poverty, I found groups working to make life a little more bearable for its inhabitants, whose prospects of returning home remain uncertain. I don't know what to say about the situation in Shabila. As you see maybe in your eyes, that it's, uh, it's misery. Even someone who has spent a long time with refugees in this camp could not find the words to adequately describe their hardship. It's a, a small area established for 3,000 people. Now we have about 22,000 people in the same location, the same size, which make the life is really difficult in all aspects. Fouad Abu Khalid used to live in a camp in Syria. When the civil war there struck, he and his family sought refuge amongst their fellow Palestinians in Lebanon's Shatila camp. But what they found was a community already struggling to get by on limited resources. The International Committee of the Red Cross built the camp as a temporary shelter for hundreds of thousands of Palestinians fleeing the 1948 Palestine War. Decades later, the Palestinians are still here, refugees with limited rights. They don't have the right to work. They don't have the right to own a house. There's difficulty in their being able to travel easily, to take a visa to other countries. They have extremely big problems. As of 2017, some half a million Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are registered with the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, an estimated 10 percent of the country's population. Unlike citizens, Palestinian refugees cannot obtain free treatment in Lebanese hospitals and are barred from most public schools. They are not living a normal, decent life. This year in May, it will be 70 years. And it's not fair that they should be living like this. Since the Palestinians first arrived in Lebanon, they have been joined by other communities fleeing conflict and poverty. Among them, 1.5 million Syrians who escaped war, as well as Kurds, Gypsies, and even impoverished Lebanese, all fighting for survival. In Shatila camp, that means more people in an already overcrowded space. For example, this place is so dark, dark. in the day dark. What the people they do? Iman Shahadi, a Palestinian, volunteers for a youth center in Shatila and has grown very familiar with the camp's problems. Look, wow. Here, one example for millions of this show yeah. in the camp. Yeah. Everything with each other. As you see, satellites, right. the cable for satellites, the cable for internet, the cable for water, the cable for electricity, the electricity of generator. You have many cables with each other. Yeah, with and power it's, running it's so, so low, and it's so low for our head. Yeah, right. She then shows me a blue box, which she says was part of a three million U.S. dollar international donor project to bring fresh water to the camp, which ultimately failed. We have to have uh, sweet water here in Shatila camp. At the end, they have a problem with the community popular 
for to paying for uh, twenty thousand every uh, every month, every every person or wow. every family that yeah. uh, they have a lot of a problem for this thing and they stop them. Twenty thousand Lebanese lira is equivalent to about thirteen U.S. dollars. So, what kind of water is available here in the camp? Salty, 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 salty water. Salty water. Yes. So, how do you make what? Do you boil the water? No. <laughs> we depend water. on it. We depend on diet. The United Nations, along with some public and private NGOs, provide the camp's residents with some basic services, but it's never enough, and the refugees are still left fending for themselves. Even security is left largely to armed Palestinian factions. Lebanese police have no power or presence here, making the camp vulnerable to criminality. They can uh, be influenced, as you see, some terrorist gang or organization, maybe they pull some of them, some of them go to drugs, some of them go to violence, some of them the depression, oppression, and some of them they really feel that they are living in uh, neglecting life, so and not all of them they can manage, really. Yet amid the poverty and misery, some NGOs have stepped in to provide some relief and give refugees a chance at a better life. Mahmoud Abbas Abu Majid is the director of the Children's Youth Center, or CYC, which helps Shatila's youth through education and recreational activities. Refugee children in Lebanon have limited access to education, so the CYC offers courses to ensure they continue learning. Despite the difficulties, Iman decided to live in Shatila to be closer to the children she teaches. How long have you lived here in the camp? Seventeen years. You were born here? No, I'm born out. But uh, when I become big and I study sociology in Lebanese University, I take my uh, decision to live with my people. To live with your people. So you could have the opportunity to live outside of this camp. Yes. But you choose to live here. Yes. My life here. Yeah. But uh, during this uh, two years, the three years, I lay if I say I don't like to be out. Because the uh, situation, the life is so, so, so bad, so difficult. Everything was a change, the electricity, the water, the life, the environment, the people. Our habits had changed, our traditional had changed. Everything was changed here. Nothing like before. She says life has become even harder for residents here after more refugees arrived. If you have, for example, five amber, the electricity for your home, now it's become less because there is the population in the camp increasing. Right. You're having to share the yes. little you already Now, had. After, after the war in Syria, many days we sit without electricity, many days we sit without uh, water. Right. Yeah. Many days uh, we have uh, uh, the, the situations, it's not normal. And this is, is make a lot of a problem in our life. At times, this has caused friction amongst the residents. Just outside Shatila in the Sabra refugee camp, Sylvia Haddad and her staff at the Joint Christian Committee for Social Services, or JCC, witness the people's daily struggles. The group aims not only to help refugees acquire skills to earn a living, but also to bridge religious divides. It was in this very camp during the Lebanese Civil War back in September of 1982 that upwards of 3,000 mostly Muslim, Palestinian and Lebanese people were killed by a militia closely aligned to the Christian Lebanese right-wing party, the Falange, which makes the work that the JCC does in this camp today all that more meaningful. For more than six decades, the JCC has provided practical education and vocational training to refugees in other impoverished communities. Although refugees in Lebanon do not have the right to work, they can open their own businesses. Now, some of our graduates from the electronics, for example, they have been able to open their own shops around the camps and then they employ others who are graduating. Uh, we heard the thing, the barbering, uh, they are able to open their own shops in the camps, around the camps, and also to take some of our graduates. Born and raised in Shatila, 16-year-old Marianne dreams of owning her own salon one day. <laughs> I 
وبس انه اتقوى كثير يعني بشغله حب افتح صالون لإلي لوحدي ومنه بصير لإلي انه في زبائن وبجيب حدا بيساعدني That's exactly what Mervet Youssef did more than a decade ago. After training with JCC, she opened this beauty salon at the Sabra refugee camp. أول شيء تعلمت بالكراس يعني أنا كان عندي الرغبة الحب للمهنة فتت على المعهد وتعلمت بالكراس بعدين يعني شوي شوي فتحت المحل أو شيء فتحت البيت وبعدين كان المحل شوي صغير يعني شوي شوي بيصير واحد. Her salon has provided work to women as more and more Palestinian men struggle to find jobs. Another woman getting an education from JCC is Nadia Ghadar, a Lebanese. The death of her mother when she was young kept Nadia from attending school, so she grew up illiterate. At JCC, she's learning to read and write from scratch. I'm JCC says it's providing refugees a crucial service, but the group now faces a struggle of their own, closure, after their building was bought by a development company. Sylvia says she's concerned about the camp's residents. The community really needs us because we have a nursery school, a kindergarten, we have women's programs, literacy programs. We are serving the community with so many programs. Everybody knows us. I hope we will not, but if we close, it will be a very black day. NGO workers like Mahmoud say they're frustrated with the hurdles facing refugees in Shatila and the lack of international political support to help alleviate their plight. In spite of what, all what we are trying to provide or what we are trying to do, raising awareness, uh, developing uh, their talents, their skills, their hobbies, etc. But the, this uh, situation of the camp, the situation of this uh, location, it's beyond our capacity as NGO or as NGOs in the camp to change or to improve uh, fully the, the life of the, the children. And all this does little to evoke promising times ahead. As refugees, they are not having the right to develop their communities, to develop their lives to this. Where is the human rights? Where those who talk about peace or talk about democracy in the world? Why they don't? Uh, act or they don't make any pressure to protect the, the children in Palestine. It's unclear when or even if these refugees will ever be able to return home. That makes the work of people like Mahmoud and Sylvia all that more critical for an ever-growing population with an uncertain future. Improving the lives of the camp's residents has become even more critical today as many Syrians now come to terms with a future here in Shatila, as many Palestinians were forced to do many years ago. Next on Assignment Asia, stories about Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. The Rohingyas are a stateless people, often referred to as one of the world's most persecuted minorities. In 2017, roughly half a million of them poured into Bangladesh, escaping deadly attacks in Myanmar. At a camp in Bangladesh, Shweta Bajaj spent time with Rohingya refugees who told stories of struggle and survival amongst the toughest of odds. It's a desperate attempt to stay alive. 
rickety rafts made of bamboo, empty jerry cans, plastic sheets and hope that they will make it to the other side. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees have made their way to Bangladesh from Myanmar on these boats. Many have died in the risky journey, while those who made it carry the scars of their audience. Mumtaz Begum lost three of her children to the violence in Myanmar's Rakhine state. Mumtaz says she and her only surviving child, the six-year-old girl, managed to escape after the military left them for dead. Mumtaz was among more than half a million people who fled a military offensive in Myanmar in August 2017. She ended up at this camp in Bangladesh, home to hundreds of thousands of Rohingyas, many of them refugees from Myanmar. The latest operation was prompted by an attack on a police outpost by members of the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army that killed 12 officers. Myanmar considers the group a terrorist organization. The UN has condemned the military's response, calling the offensive a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. It's a charge Myanmar vehemently denies. There are many allegations and counter-allegations. It is very difficult, uh, counter-terrorism, because terrorism by its nature means that some of their members are embedded in the ordinary population. And, and uh, how we distinguish the one from the other is very important. We don't want to hurt those who are innocent, but at the same time we have to make sure that terrorists are not allowed to carry on with their activities. The Rohingyas have been living in a heavily guarded area in Rakhine State for decades. While most are Muslims, there are Hindus too. The government considers them illegal immigrants from Bangladesh and have denied them citizenship. Myanmar State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi said the conflict in Rakhine State is far more complicated than it seems. Periodically, trouble has broken out there between the Muslim community and the Rakhine community. And we have inherited 
this very complex problem and we have to deal with it and we have to resolve it. So obviously it's not something that we can do overnight and it's not something that uh, we can uh, find simple answers to. There were an estimated 1 million Rohingyas living in Myanmar before the 2016-2017 crisis. The crisis that started on 25th August 2017 has seen more than 600,000 Rohingyas move from their homeland in Myanmar, cross rivers, cross forests and reach here in Bangladesh. A typical scene in any of the camps. Long lines of refugees trying to get whatever food they can at distribution points set up by aid agencies. Children, many of them unaccompanied, stand for hours on end. Resources are stretched thinner and thinner as the number of people in need rises. One in four Rohingya children are, are suffering from malnutrition and you know, those, that, those numbers are alarming um, you know, and that's something that you know, we really need to focus on. We really need to you know, help make sure that we get nutritious food not only to, to children under five but also to pregnant and breastfeeding women. Besides malnutrition, refugees also face the threat of disease because of unhygienic conditions in the camps. Even as Bangladesh's government and humanitarian agencies work hard to meet refugees' needs, a public health crisis threatens to make things worse. We are sitting on a like time bomb kind of thing. It's ticking all the time. And if we don't keep on reacting, it could just explode any moment and we could face another emergency within this existing emergency. The crisis has broken up Rohingya families and left many children orphaned. Since leaving Myanmar, Nurasha Begum hasn't heard from her husband, whom she believes was arrested by the military. Now she has to take care of all her four children alone. Hers is a common story here in Cox's Bazar's largest refugee camp. The UNHCR says 14% of refugees are single mothers who lost their husbands to the violence. Losing family members also meant some children have to shoulder heavy responsibilities. 16-year-old Anamul Hassan came here with his aging mother and two sisters. They were forced to leave behind their father who was unable to make the days-long journey to Bangladesh because of poor health. According to UNICEF, 60% of refugees here are children. They have seen more horrors than their young minds could comprehend. And for many, the trauma lingers. Twelve-year-old Johnny Alam had been here for three months when I met him. He was drawing what he says he saw, a military helicopter that dropped petrol bombs that burned his house down. He lost his mother while fleeing Myanmar. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a military. Boom, I'm a helicopter too. Murasai.
Muramadar Farodi Kurdin Dutaki. Pia, the Shida Shida Gia Gorzore, Rade Sularo, the Dora military Gulimar, Sara Nakunda Sorotai. Among the refugees, women suffered some of the most traumatic experiences. 18-year-old Sahira Khatun says she was raped when she was six months pregnant. Myanmar has repeatedly denied that abuses were committed against the Rohingya, but vowed to bring to justice those proven guilty. As regards the alleged sexual violence, the government of Myanmar has made its position clear that it will not condone any human rights abuse. If there is concrete evidence, we are ready to take action against the transgressor in accordance with the law, no matter who or what he is. Myanmar said it is ready to accept and assist Rohingyas who wish to return to Rakhine, provided they can verify their identities. ယင်းနောက်ထုတ်ပေးခဲ့တဲ့ဝိုက်ကတ်တွေကျွန်တော်တို့ရှိပါတယ်ဒီကျွန်တော်တို့ For their part, Rohingyas want Myanmar to guarantee their safety and recognize them as citizens. Still, despite the difficulties here, and even as uncertainty hangs over their future, some refugees say they prefer to stay. For Assignment Asia, I'm Shweta Bajaj in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. The governments of Bangladesh and Myanmar have reached an agreement over the repatriation of Rohingya refugees. Yet many Rohingyas fear going back to a country they've escaped from. There's much concern still over their safety. That's all the time we have for this week's program from the Shatila refugee camp in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm Natalie Carney. Join us again for another episode of Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.